Welcome to another episode of the Rediscovery Channel, where each week, myself, Stilger, and Ivor, my buddy here, we talk to each other about a different topic. And the idea is that the other person doesn't know what the other what we're going to be talking about. And actually, this week, it is my turn. And um, Ivor, I want to talk about something, and I wonder how much you know about this. It's actually the uh, Second Anglo-Dutch War. Do you know anything about the Anglo-Dutch Wars at all? I don't know anything at all. I know you guys had wars with uh, the Spanish. I didn't know you had wars with the English. So this is a total uh, surprise to me. Yes. So actually, um, we were talking about the Spanish Armada in a previous episode. And I did check it. And yes, it was actually the Dutch and the English that together fought off the, the Spaniards. Uh, I think that was in the year 1588 that defeated the... Uh, the Spanish Armada. Um, so it was two Protestants, majority, mostly Protestants, Protestant nations fighting off these uh, the Spaniards. Um, but now we're talking about almost a hundred years later, and uh, we're talking about a war that took place between the year 1665, uh, March of that year, and it ended in July 1667. Um, and I want to talk about this story because um, not only is it a story on bravery and cunning and about one upcoming economic power, namely England, versus the existing world power of the time, which was the Dutch Republic of the Seven Provinces. Um, and uh, there are actually also a couple of lessons to be learned on what we are seeing now in the world today. Uh, where one established power is being overtaken by another, and I won't yeah, mention that's, any. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it sounds like you're you're going to talk about uh, Thucydides' trap, which is Thucydides' trap uh, is that rule that uh, when there's a, a declining power, then they always come into conflict with the ascending power, and it's like um, I think the idea is that it's a, uh, a single single power system or something like that like i'm not sure okay. i think the, i think there it's actually the idea is that the the power that's like leading at the time and that's being overtaken is using some kind of aggression to prevent that from happening and in this story it's actually the other way around so okay. uh, it's actually a story about preparedness and or more so the lack of preparedness and um, I want to talk a little bit about the background of the, the Second uh, Anglo-Dutch War and then focus on how it ended, and which is namely um, in the raid on the Medway. And does that ring any bell with you by any chance, raid on the Medway, when I say that? Still nothing. Medway or? Yes, the raid on the Medway. Yeah. No, no, I, I mean, it's good. I, I didn't expect you to, but you, you never know how much... Uh, Americans know about English uh, history, um, and <laughs> yeah, um, and for us, it's, it, know it's, about, it's, uh, those, for uh, us, it's quite uh, important. But yeah, you you probably focus on on different parts, right? Um, stuff. Yes. So the the second Anglo-Dutch War came about 15 years after the first Anglo-Dutch War, uh, which was concluded with the Treaty of Westminster. Um, however, the causes for the war were still there. Um, and this was mostly around commercial rivalry. So, in fact, uh, the Federal Dutch Republic, um, which had come out of the revolt against the Spanish in 1588 for religious and economic freedom, um, it had over a hundred year time span to become the most powerful trading nation in the world um, at the time. Um, and unlike the English, um, its major interest wasn't colonization as much, but rather it was trade. And a prime example uh, of this was uh, the, of the Dutch approach was the Dutch East India Company, uh, which was a, a type of government directed proto mega corporation, which was funded by shares and bonds. And it even had like a fully integrated global supply chain. And it traded in things like uh, spices and coffee from the East Indies, uh, nowadays Indonesia, um, sugarcane from Dutch Formosa, which is nowadays Taiwan, and uh, wine from uh, Cape of Good Hope, nowadays Cape Town in South Africa. 
Uh, but uh, the, the VOC, as it was called, the Verenigd Oost Indische Compagnie, so the Dutch East Indies Company, uh, they also had like explorers like Abel Tasman, who discovered New Zealand, named after the Dutch province Zeeland, Zeeland. Um, and in the west of the world, there was the colony New Netherland, uh, with its capital New Amsterdam, which yeah, is now nowadays. Uh, yeah. Yeah, New York. Now this New York. I did know, and also, you know, I knew about the Dutch East India Company and uh, the colony in South Africa. So that much I did know. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the Dutch um, were actually so powerful that uh, Dutch trade volume, it surpassed that of all European nations combined. So hmm. if you added all the trade of all the European countries, uh, France, UK, Italy, put it all together, Dutch had more. Uh, and this was all directed from a, a tiny country. It's about this, uh, one less than one third the size of Florida. And at the time, it had 1.5 million inhabitants. Um, and England at the time already had 6 million inhabitants, although it wasn't as urbanized as the Dutch Republic. So uh, at the time, Charles II was reinstated as uh, the King of England. Uh, there was a fair share of envy that he had of all this wealth. So he kind of changed his focus from uh, Spain and France to the Netherlands. And, um, yeah, like they were close allies before, uh, but now, you know, uh, English privateers were starting to use, um, like the, the navigation act as a pretext to like go upon, uh, Dutch mercantile ships and take them, seize them and, uh, claim that they were trading with, um, uh, between the colonies, uh, like, uh, English colonies and non-English countries which was forbidden. <laughs> um, and uh, at the same time, he was also trying to install his nephew, William of Orange, as the Stadthouder, which was kind of like a, uh, like a yeah, it's like, kind of like a, a head of state, although not, not completely, because we, we were a republic at the time. But there was a fight between the royalists and the republicans to some degree. Mm. Um, so yeah, the English, they were quite successful and they were taking hundreds of Dutch uh, merchant ships uh, to the point where it really started to hurt the, the Dutch economy. Um, and in uh, 1665, things were particularly bad for the Dutch, um, not just because they lost so many ships, but, uh, but they also lost New Netherlands and with that, New Amsterdam. Um, so then the next phase of the battle was that there were several naval battles, but here's the thing. The Dutch were at a disadvantage because the English, they had much larger ships that were built only for battles. Whereas the Dutch, they had ships that were smaller and they were hybrid boats that could also be used for trades. And they had actually recently sold off some of their battleships um, because they were, you know, they were Dutch. They were mostly interested in trade and not so much in war. And even though people were warning that, hey, look, England is preparing and they're getting a better fleet, um, these people were neglected. And so then when this war broke out, the second um, Anglo-Dutch war, they were quite in a bit of, of, of a pickle. Um, so what followed there was there were several major na naval battles with uh, hundreds of ships on each side. Uh, the, the main one was the Battle of Lovestoft. Uh, which resulted in 16 lost ships for the Dutch. Then on land, there was also an invasion by the Bishop of Munster uh, that was also paid by the English to invade the public. Um, and um, well, what the Dutch actually did after they lost is they just rebuilt the fleet. And they had one advantage there is because they were able to churn out so many merchant ships, they had the capacity to build boats very very quickly so they built new ones with bigger guns bigger ones and then in 1666 there was another battle between about 80 ships on both sides uh, with both sides enduring heavy losses and, and yet both proclaiming victory um, there was also one interesting altercation that i want to bring up is where the english they decided to raid and burn down their schelling which is one of the dutch islands and they completely pillage and burn down the town 
as well as burned 140 merchant vessels. And uh, upon this, Charles II, he ordered bonfires to be lit in celebration of the victory. And a poem was written that goes like this. Okay, quote, where are those boasting boars? What are their names? That swore they blocked us up the river Thames. Brave were it done, I must confess, the Hogan was very willing, but wanted Mogan. Our streets were thick with bonfires, large and tall. But Holmes, one bonfire made, was worth them all. Well done, Sir Robert, bravely done, I swear. Whilst we made bonfires here, you made them there. So, basically, <laughs> <laughs> they made a nice bonfire out of this uh, this town. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I like it. Aww. So, yeah, so then there was a, a third major sea battle. Um and uh, this uh, culminated in a clear English victory again. Uh, but part of the Dutch Navy managed to get away uh, yet again. So, um, yeah, you know, you'd think that things were looking pretty good for the English. Uh, you know, they've won uh, several times already. And maybe the Dutch should just go ahead and give up, right? And they were like, the English were pushing a, a peace treaty. Um, that were kind of like not in the best interest for the Dutch to, to accept. Um, but at the same time, you know, the Dutch had a lot of money in their coffers. They were very wealthy and they had a lot of production capacity. So they just kept out churning out new ships. Well, where did and... you get your wood from? Because it's not like uh, there's a lot of wood in that part of the world even back then. Yeah, there was trade uh, with uh, all of the Hansa cities already. So I imagine it would be coming from places like Finland and Estonia, Russia, um, Russia as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and they were be able they were able to produce many ships uh, rather quickly. Um, and I think the the, the numbers were like uh, whenever the Dutch would make sixty, the English were able to turn out like eight or twelve ships. So even though they were smaller ships, the production numbers were just much higher. And London or England also had an issue because uh, they were hit by the plague. Um, wow. And actually, I think it was like uh, one one quarter of the uh, population of London died. And then there was also the Great Fire of 1666, uh, which didn't help either. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, you know, uh, just like in, did you ever play Sid Meier Civilization? No, but I did play, uh, the first three Age of Empires games okay. pretty, yeah, and that's actually what I've been thinking about, like, uh, as you're, as you're talking about this, because in the, the, uh, third Age of Empires game, like, the Dutch, uh, is like one of the playable civilizations, Yeah, and they can actually build banks and continue yeah. to generate gold revenue without like like everybody else has to mine the gold but they can they get like a uh revenue bonus from having banks yeah exactly so, so you technical. know like mo modern corporations to some degree is are like a, a dutch invention so i know we should be proud of it but yeah so yeah there were, there was a lot more money um and then the production capacity as well i think if you would compare it to nowadays you know i think that china would be building a lot of merchant ships nowadays like container ships and would have a they, I think they're able to produce vast amounts of ships as well. So they're quickly catching up. So it's not just about the amount of ships you, you currently have, but it's also about the production capacity. I think you also see this in some of these re real-time strategy games, like Red Alert, you know? Like sometimes your game. opponent yeah. will have like a giant army, but because you're just able to produce so much more, so much faster, like you keep losing, but you keep coming back anyway. And that's kind of what was going on here. Um, and then in the year, okay, so the year of 1667, and um, this is the third and final year. And this was a year that they started this raid on the Medway, uh, which was a cunning military raid by Willem Joseph van Gent and Michiel de Ruiter, who was a Lieutenant Admiral of the Dutch Navy. And it's kind of like a war hero over here. Um, now, because England was running out of money, it's, despite having the upper hand, uh, many of its heavy ships were docked up in Chatham, which lies just outside of London on the Medway River. 
which is why it's called the Raid on the Medway. This is an extremely secluded Bay Area uh, that was guarded by both military force and a, a major uh, choke point where the English never expected an attack. So Michiel, the, uh, the Admiral of the Dutch Navy, he set out with 62 frigates, 15 lighter ships and 12 fire ships. You know what fire ships by any chance, Ivor? Yeah, those are uh, small ships that you use to light bigger ships on fire. I think uh, you light them on fire first, right? And yeah. then drive them into the side of a larger ship. Yeah, basically they would just uh, sail them downwind, uh, set them on fire, and there sometimes there would be explosives on there as well. So there would be like a delayed explosion. So the idea was to uh, to hit them that way. Didn't the uh, English also do that to Spain? In yes, they were also used during the uh, the um, the Armada as well. Um, so yeah, this was an older tactic. Uh, it may have been around actually since Roman times. I, I wouldn't know that. That's a good one to check up on, actually. Yeah, that uh, I think we're going to have to see that because um, I don't know that one either. I know that the Byzantines they they had like some kind of hose that would spray fire on the enemies, but I don't think they used like ships that were lit on fire. Mm, that's a good one to check up on. Yeah, you have to find that out. So yeah, this this, uh, this Dutch uh, navy uh, they sailed off on the sixth of June, and uh, as the fog bank hanging over the river was blown away, it revealed the Dutch fleet to the English, and English morale was quite low, and and actually many sailors hadn't been paid in quite some time. Um, and the Dutch carried with them a contingent of 1,000 Marines, which was a newly found, found a task force that was highly trained and meant as a fast res response expedition uh, unit. And that was founded by Michiel, actually, as a, as a new kind of battle tactic. And um, the, the Dutch fleet uh, arrived at the, uh, the Isle of Sheppey on the 10th of June. Uh, and it, uh, it launched an attack on the, the fort, uh, Garrison Point Fort. Um, and, um, yeah, so it, it was actually, um, I think it was actually the, the ship called the Jan van Brakel who, uh, ended up, um, sailing across this big chain that was there as well. So they had one of these giant chains similar to Constantinople that was supposed to keep the, the, sh the ships from going onto this river and going to their to their docks where all the ships were being built and where they were being stored. Uh, but actually they just ran, most likely just ran over the construction that was holding the chain with, with their boat uh, and breaking the chain that way. Um, and what happened then was, um, so there was, the Dutch were firing upon the fort. Um, they made a landing as well. The, the fort was destroyed uh, fairly quickly. And actually when uh, the people, the Englishmen found out that, uh, no, actually it was Scottish um, soldiers of a Scottish garrison. They found out that there was no surgeon on, um, stationed there. They, they all deserted and they left because they're like, yeah, I'm not going to get blown to shit, you know, not to pieces and then uh, not be able to, to get fixed up. And then, um, yeah, they were unable to hold back like uh, some 800 Dutch Marines that landed about a mile away. And uh, what followed was just the English reti retreating and kind of sinking ships in the water and hoping that uh, the Dutch would not be able to navigate the river that way. So they just kept on sinking many ships, mm. uh, but it didn't work out. Like there was supposed to be a pattern to it and one of the ships didn't sink on time and the Dutch were able to get through. So now we're on the, the 12th of June and there was a big standoff um, and the Dutch sent in like the final standoff, the Dutch sent in like fire ships and they sank in several English ships and captured otters. Um, and then uh, actually this is when the chain was most likely overrun. Um, and then they took the Royal Charles, which was like one of the prize ships of the English uh, Navy. And even though it was like low tide and it shouldn't be able, to, they shouldn't be able to sail it out, they were able to tilt it in a way. And that way it was less deep in the water and they took it and they sailed it out to the Netherlands. And when the English saw this, that like uh, saw their, their like their beautiful ship sail out, they were like in full panic mode, and uh, they ordered to sink the remainder of the English warships, 
So at least the Dutch wouldn't be able to steal them. And then maybe like afterwards, they would be able to like just, you know, drain out the water and salvage them that way. Um, and people in, in uh, along the Thames, they started to hear rumors that the Dutch were, were actually carrying like French army. And many Londoners, like they fled to the countryside and they took their possessions because they were they were scared. Um, so the Dutch, they continued their advance. Why were they into, particularly yeah. more scared of the French? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I wonder why. I think they were just scared of a French invasion. Um, and, and that's actually one of the things is like the Dutch have never been really strong in on land, uh, also because of the, the numbers of people we have. Um, so yeah, I think the most uh, the fighting done by the Dutch has always been like naval battles. Um, so that that's a good question. Dutch I'm not sure. Were already winning, and you know the the possibility must have been there that they would come out. But when they when these guys heard they were French, they're like, oh no, like. Maybe there was a lot of pro more propaganda already against the French. Actually, Charles II also put up a lot of propaganda against the Dutch as well. Were French uh, known for brutality? That could be. That could be. And and actually, there was there was some um, some Dutch beheadings or alleged Dutch uh, where the Dutch beheaded. I think it was like twelve Englishmen fifty years before in some other battle. Uh, and, and there was all this propaganda by Charles to kind of highlight this and make the Dutch look really bad. They, they did the same thing in the Boer Wars later on, where they kind of dehumanized de their, their opponents. Um, and yeah, I don't know why they were so afraid of the French and, and not so much of the Dutch. Good question. Maybe, yeah, if Dutch, well, cutting somebody's head off, I mean, I don't want to have my head cut off, but I think that's. Uh, one of the less painful ways to die. It's kind of quick compared with, you know, burning and other things. So yeah, but but this was also like twelve people or something like that, and and it might, it might also be because the Dutch were allies and they they actually had the same religion, right? They were both Protestants, and the Catholic uh, French were maybe more scary to them. Maybe they would fear a French uh, invasion, the Catholic invasion like that. So that could be a reason. They, but there must be, I mean, we know Spain had like a, a history of torture. So, and of course this is, um, this would be uh, before the French Revolution that like you talked about in your other video where they were doing all the brutal torture. So I'm just wondering, you know, like what it is that because they, they already knew the Dutch could come on land and, and jack them up. But, like, they're particularly af afraid of the French. So I'm wondering why. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Like, the Dutch weren't, I, I don't know. I don't think we had that name. Like, we weren't colonizers, right? We did fight. Like, there were quite a lot of uh, wars with the English. At some point, there were also, like, battles uh, over, um, over islands in the Indies. And it was... But it wasn't for like to try and replace the population. It was actually about like uh, to get the monopoly on muscat, which is like a, a spice. Um, I don't, I'm muscat. I don't. I'm not sure if it's the same in English. Is that a spice in English as well? I'd have to look up. The I English. I don't know. When you say musket, I think of like a primitive gun. So, <laughs> I guess the, I don't know what the English translation would be. All right, let me actually nutmeg, nutmeg. Okay, the, nutmeg. Yeah. So uh, there, there were actually the nutmeg wars between the English and the Dutch, where, or actually the, the the Dutch East Indies Company was fighting these wars um, over a couple islands because they were the exclusive territory where they would grow nutmeg. Uh, but anyway, but they, yeah, so it was usually just around money and it wasn't really there were there was no like bad blood between the dutch or the english um at this point so maybe that was good that was the reason but there is um, a bad a lot of bad history between the french and the english for, for sure for sure yeah yeah so anyway so back, back to the battle right so uh so there was all this panic and they the dutch continued like their advance um up the medway river uh, to the Chatham docks, uh, where these uh, ships were stationed and, and being built. And they used the fire ship Delft, Rotterdam, Draak, Wapen van Londen, Gouden Appel, and Princess, uh, which were under fire from Opner Castle and Free Store ba uh, batteries. And then the Dutch returned fire on the shore batteries, and they lost about 40 men. 
uh, and the fire ships did their jobs and they burned down another three of the finest ships in the English Navy. And uh, most of the English crews abandoned their half-flooded ships to avoid capture, with the exception of Captain Archibald Douglas of the Scotsfoot, who refused to leave his ship the Royal Oak and subsequently perished in the flames. So may he be forever be remembered. And um, then on uh, June 14th, Cornelis de Witt, uh, which was the head of the country at the time, he decided to forego further advances. And the Dutch, um, they did go in using some rowboats, even at night, just to check if there were any ships left that were like half sunk and they burned those down as well. <laughs> um, but they didn't burn down the docks and production sites themselves. And not much later, a treaty was signed that was favorable for the Dutch. And it was a much better one that was proposed to them just shortly before. And on the, the Dutch side, there were only 50 casualties, um, or around 50, and eight fire ships lost. And one of the things is, um, also one of the commendable things, is that the, they didn't plunder the countryside, which they could have done as a you know, retaliation for the, the burning of their schelling. Um, but they were explicitly told not to do so. That and probably a, messed with the trade opportunities later on. Yeah, but these were also <laughs> deeply re religious people as well, uh, believe it or not. And they were, so they, Michiel told them, yeah, definitely don't do it. And when some guys actually um, tried to bust open a, a church, it was actually the church door of St. George, James Church on the Isle of Grain, um, he actually sent his own men to repair the damage done. And apparently, the, this church is still there. And you can actually see the woodwork of the, the Dutch carpenter that fixed, uh, fixed the door. That's cool. Um, yeah, so that's pre pretty cool. Um, so um, Samuel Pepys, who was the administrator of the English Navy, he wrote, it seems very remarkable to me and of great honor to the Dutch that those of them that did go on shore to Gillingham, though they went in fear of their lives and were some of them killed and notwithstanding their provocation at Schelling, yet killed none of our people nor plundered their houses, but did take some things of easy carriage and left the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and not a house burned and which is to our eternal disgrace that what my Lord Douglas's men who came after them found there, they plundered and took all away. Mm. So yeah, after this, um, this daring assault of the, the raid on the Dutch, which was one of the biggest losses to the, uh, the English Navy ever. I think it was, was actually the biggest one uh, throughout history. Um, after that, the Dutch controlled the sea again and were able to continue their commercial dominance at least until the next Anglo-Dutch war, because you know, you cannot stop history. Uh, and one Englishman wrote about the amount of Dutch ships at the time patrolling the English coast after the altercation. He wrote, uh, quote, I think the devil shits Dutchmen. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was a funny quote, <laughs> a very English thing to say. Um, so yeah, the aftermath was uh, not just a severe humiliation for the English, uh, the cost in today's money and damages to the English Navy is around $6.5 billion. And that's mm. about the same cost of the, the two brand new uh, air carriers that they have, the only two that they have. So I think one is still actually in production. But um, uh, yeah, those costs cost about $7 billion in total. But yeah, this kind of brings me to the, the moral of the story, <laughs> the lesson from history. Uh, unfortunately, the Dutch have over the past few decades thoroughly neglected its once proud navy. And this is a mistake that is repeated throughout history again and again. Uh, and even though we do still have production capabilities because uh, yachts, uh, dredging, merchant ships are still built here, um, you know, it's important to safeguard this kind of capacity and, and invest in the future defense of your country. Uh, because new economic and military threats loom over the horizon, and you never know when they're going to come. Um, and the other lesson that we continue to forget is that just because we're not interested in war, that doesn't mean others aren't. And yeah. uh, being wealthy makes you a prime target. And um, the final lesson is that you know if you are negotiating treaties, it's always the good do 
good to do this from a position of power if you have something to back it up like a strong navy for example and uh yeah unfortunately our peaceful culture of the netherlands that's predominantly interested in trade um that yeah i mean on the one hand that makes us quite successful and quite quite prosperous uh, but it also causes uh, the country to neglect early warning signs of war uh, again and again and again. Um, yeah, and that's kind of my story of this week. So, yeah, and that's like what happened with the the Harappans who um, didn't have any kind of military capacity at all, other than maybe like you know local police force or sheriff or something like that. Well, I mean, maybe if they even had that. And then and and then they just got stomped down on by a less advanced culture that you know less advanced in every respect except for the art of war. So yeah, you yeah, can't really I, bribe an yeah. enemy like that because um, yeah, as soon as you pull out the money, like here, take this and go away, they're gonna they're gonna be like, well, I can just come to you and take everything anyways, and you won't be able to do anything about it. Well, the thing is, there were people warning at the time, like, hey, the English are overtaking and we should be preparing ourselves. And uh, they just didn't want to hear it because, you know, it will cost money and people were just too interested in making money. And because the Dutch had no interest in starting a war, um, they just didn't think that maybe other people wouldn't be the same. Um, yeah, thinking yeah. everybody else is going to be reasonable and logical is is the wrong mindset to have. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you gotta, what was it, Eowyn, I think, uh, in Lord of the Rings, she said, like, uh, you know, just because you don't, I can't remember exactly, is that something like, those who don't know how to use a sword can still die on them. Hmm. Because it's, because they're like, oh, well, you're, oh, now, I don't want to say something that's wrong, but it's, it's been a while since I read, but they're like, why does a woman, you know, people that say, like, well, why does a woman uh, need to fight? Why that's not a woman's job? And, like, it's, you know, my view has always been, like, women should be able to defend themselves because by default they're at a strength disadvantage. So it's very good, you know, to learn how to use weapons and also build your strength a little bit in your reflexes. You know, because uh, just because you don't know how to defend yourself or you're not physically able to doesn't mean that anybody else is going to care. Like maybe they, you can still be jacked up and, and more easily. So, yeah, it's always good to be prepared. Like it's, you know, it's one thing to uh, to be very peaceful. Like, you know, like imagine the schoolyard and you're the kid that doesn't want to start any fights and it's always trying to you know be peaceful and and, and kind to all the others yeah. uh that's great but it's even better if you have the muscle to uh to defend yourself should somebody start something or, or the willpower it, yeah or the cunning yeah because like one thing that happens in those in like those playground situations as kids you can have kids that are like the most like the the biggest and the strongest kid can still get bullied by a weaker kid who's physically weaker just because he doesn't have the will to fight. And then you can also have a kid who is weaker physically but dominates the others because he has like a greater will. And I'm not going to go into the anecdotes, but um, no, it's kind of it's kind of like the Japanese kind of bushido kind of way, right? Like it's like you know, like you're not out there, you're not training to start fights, you're not training because you want to beat people up, you're just training because you want peace and Although Japan uh, did beat up many of their neighbors many you know they did they did actually and and that's actually a really interesting uh, story as well i've been listening to uh the latest um hardcore history about uh um japan's rise and fall which is very interesting um they're an interesting people but yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, man, but this war is, is, uh, was, was interesting. And actually, they, so they took the Royal Charles, this giant uh, naval ship. I think it had like 75 or more guns from England. And they actually had to dry dock it and use it as a tourist attraction because the, at the time, the, the Dutch shore was too shallow for big ships like that. So that was another reason, actually, that they had mostly smaller ships. Um, mm. And um, so it, it just served as a tourist attraction for kids. <laughs> Dude, you know, uh, the pride of the UK Navy. It's still, I think part of it is still around. It's it's still in the museum. I'll see if I could add a picture. And, and, and one more funny uh, anecdote, sorry, is uh, there was this guy um, at the dockyard 
uh, some his name last name was Pets, I think it was P E T T, and he ran off with all these models of his ships, and then they made it sound like okay, hey, this guy like what a nerd, like what a coward, he ran off with all these you know toy ships. But the reason he did this, actually, like in the, the British press, they made it sound like he was like this, you know, they made him kind of like a scapegoat. But it, like there was a really good reason to do this because they didn't have like technical drawings. Like they would just make these things like by eye, you know, and they would use these models to kind of, you know, they to to ha- to look at how to build these ships. And they these were the latest models, you know, on which they would build the next uh uk or english navy so yeah anyway we still haven't talked about how is it that these guys are raising ships back then how do you raise a ship in the 1600s or the 1800s oh i think uh you might just wait till the tide uh uh drops now okay maybe in some places but that's not going to work everywhere yeah, they, they would just uh, put them in the shallow water and I, I guess they would try to get them out or, or maybe just use parts to rebuild or use the the basic of the ship to rebuild the ship or they would we gotta pump. we got to find out what they did. We still yeah. haven't found out. They, they, might, they might use uh, buckets or something like that, but that's a good uh, – I'll, I'll try to see if I can find that, uh, yeah. that information. I, and I also forgot. I should have also looked into it, but this video reminded me, so – yeah, but that was my uh, my episode. I'm gonna keep it a little bit short. And, yeah, um, that was a good one. I never heard that before, so you completely got me. I, <clears throat> I I hadn't heard of any of that before. Yeah, maybe there's a Dutch listener out there some somewhere, and uh, they'll be inspired to uh, petition the government to uh, <laughs> to build more ships. I think we need to build a carrier ship. I'm not gonna lie. Just as um, uh, not because uh, we need to invade anybody, it's just kind of like, hey, you know what? Like we got a sting. But, what you uh, need to get is a nuclear submarine with ICBMs. That yeah. way you have second strike capability, and then for your for your country, you need to get an iron dome like Israel has. Yeah, we do have uh, American nukes here. Actually, that's why we uh, I think we had to buy the F thirty five because um, that one can carry the U S nukes. But yeah, that's kind of like a last ditch scenario. It would be nice to have some kind of projection of power and and like you don't want to go like face to face with China and the U S. But you can be a little bit innovative and maybe make a carrier ship with with like helicopters or something and just. uh, Try to think outside of the box, you know. Well, if you have to go to war with China and the United States, then you need to have second strike capabilities because the because like uh, both of those countries have huge uh, nuclear arsenal and also big armies. So you need like you need to have something that after your country gets hit that you can reply. So if you have submarine, if you have nuclear missiles on a submarine, then even if your country gets nuked, you can still give like the vengeful strike and you could move your um, submarine even if you don't have like ICBMs but you just have short range missiles you can move your submarine close to whatever country you're fighting with and nuke them from the shore like hit one of their big cities or hit their capital city yeah so, but that's like again it's like you know like nuclear war but at that point in time like the Netherlands is so small you, you could just if you if you hit it with two uh, nuclear weapons probably wouldn't be anything left but yeah, we used to have like really good we used to have really good uh subs by the way diesel subs uh the best in the world but that's like world again era. yeah although they can be more silent than nuclear ones you guys so, lost in world war ii we did lose in world war ii yeah yeah we did uh we did actually have uh, some of our navy was left in uh in indonesia and was fighting the japanese um under english command so yeah <laughs> Anyway, yeah, dude, that Good was one. my story. So uh, again, um, anybody likes the story, any suggestions, any comments, uh, put them down in the comments feed. Uh, we put pictures. We put great care into finding good pictures for a story. You can find our video on BitChute and YouTube. Uh, you can listen to our podcast on pretty much any podcast uh, program out there. But if you want to share this with uh, with your friends or just give it a like, um, let us know what you think. We really appreciate it. We're just doing this for the fun of it because we like history and we think it's really important. And we appreciate it. And we look forward to building a, a bit of a history uh, community. 
together. And um, yeah, I think I, I want to conclude it with that. Anything from your side, Ivor? No, uh, I think you said everything that needs to be said. Uh, share the video. Uh, share the video, as always. If you like it, share it, and leave a comment.